everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of the Comic Book Showcase. I'm your host, Jamie Hari. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator of this motley crew of fine folks today. We're going to be talking about the uh, Season 2 premiere of Gotham. Uh, today, we're joined by uh, Rab and Billy and Kyle. Uh, and we're going to... And, but mostly importantly, Billy. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to we're gonna talk about uh, the premiere and all the things that have happened and where it's going. But before we do that, actually, just want uh, a couple of quick notes. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of premieres that are happening in the next couple of uh, days and weeks, and we're going to have an episode from some or most of those. Um, but I want to point out we also have a couple of new add-ons. Uh, this season, not only are we doing the same show that you love from the first season, uh, you know, four guys or five guys talking about all the comic book stuff that you love, but we've also got these two side shows that we're doing. Uh, the first is called I Just Read, uh, and it is, uh, you know, obviously a comic book we just read. Uh, and you can find that uh, and our second series, Obscure, Obscure Spotlight, both on our YouTube channel, Comic Book Showcase. So have a look, check those out. They're short little videos. We hope you like them. Uh, we'll be doing those all throughout the season, and uh, let's get right into it. So um, we just watched, uh, you know, just a few nights ago, the uh, premiere, and a lot happened. You know, obviously there's characters that are changing and... Um, let's let's talk about it first. Why don't we go over to um, Kyle? You you and I had been talked a little bit earlier about uh, Barbara and some of uh, her sort of evolution or, or changes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you thought about her uh, evolution in uh, season two? Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, she kind of started out as the love interest and kind of this innocent, we thought innocent character, <laughs> and they built her, you know, slowly throughout the season, kind of. You know, hinting at she's not quite as innocent and good as she appears. And I think I, I don't know if everyone kind of thought this, but I thought, you know, it was just like we're going to make her more human. I didn't really expect for them to go full on bad guy with her, which it appears to be what they're going to do with her in season two. I think that it's strange that they have taken her to this level and kind of made her a character that's not so likable anymore which troubles me somewhat. I mean, she wasn't... For me, personally, she wasn't that likable to begin with, but I th I think it's strange to sort of turn <coughs> the idea of uh, uh, Jim Gordon's lady friend, Barbara Keane, and turn it on its head into making her a, a bad guy, bad guy character rather Can than I the mother of Barbara Gordon or the aunt of Barbara Gordon, whatever your situation is. Uh, I just want to say I love that now that Barbara's gone and we're like, we've entered a new era of Leslie as the big relationship in the show, they're like, oh, what, what can we do to set this apart? And immediately starting out in this episode, the storyline is like, oh, Jim is driving her away by keeping secrets about his job. Oh, oh man, we haven't seen that before. <laughs> Yeah, but let's hope Leslie actually yeah, handles it better. She just also eventually becomes a serial killer also, and that is the plot of every subsequent season. Of As he drives someone away, they become a serial killer, next girl, and repeat perfect formula. Yeah, well, let's hope she actually handles it better, Leslie handles it better than Barbara did, because I tell you, the very first thing when, if you remember the episode partway through, season one, where uh, Jim actually, like, takes her away and says, look, I'm going to go deal with the mafia right now. I need you to go be safe. And the first thing she does is immediately run to Falcone's house. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this one's a keeper. Take her <clears> on the mafia. Liter literally everything will be fixed as long as the only thing you do is just not interfere and go, but, you, I, I... Okay, and the, uh, okay, I'm putting I'm putting you on the train. I'm, I'm you're not gonna leave. I'm physically following you in the train. I'm making I placed a phone call, making sure you're upstate. Okay, Jim, I, w I won't interfere this time. Yeah. And All right. It. So uh, enough of that. What did uh, what else did we think? What was uh, what was a highlight? What did we love? What did we hate? One of my favorite things that were I. I'm enjoying uh, the the tone this season. A lot of people have talked about how they are planning on making a big change this season from uh, doing an episodic show to a more serialized show, whereas the first season was very, like, monster, villain of the week focused. This will be more just sort of an ongoing saga. And that seemed like a lot of fun already. It was nice that the whole episode was focused on 
plot lines that have been running throughout the show instead of everybody running around to figure out one bullshit character, bullshit mystery of the week that I didn't care about. I think the tone has improved. Well, I want to say the tone has improved, but I think the tone was sort of pretty consistent in terms of just the atmosphere of the show and the 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 grit, I guess. I don't want to say grit necessarily, but the the atmosphere of the show. And I think in this one there seems to be it just in this one episode there seems to be more momentum than there ever was in the first season yeah. where it was just like here's the next thing, here's the next thing and like people were there was action but it was like Penguin goes over to this guy and gets in a sticky situation, and then he gets out of that sticky situation, and then he gets into this other sticky situation, and it's just that's that was the only <laughs> ongoing Whoa. plot line. The only ongoing plot line for the show is just the penguin getting in and out. That necessary? What? Yes. <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing music for the penguins wacky hijinks. <laughs> I feel like the Benny Hill theme would be more uh, appropriate. That was the Benny Hill theme. That's I that's what, <laughs> I kind of just wanted to see that show where just every episode is just like a sitcom like a Three's Company style Gotham Mafia sitcom with the penguin. So oh, what was it brought did, Oh no, I brought both mobsters I'm supposed to be reporting to to the same dance. Why aren't you a writer on this show? And that's what I'm. I know. That's what I keep saying. Um, <laughs> All right. So I want to. I want to just step up for a second and say, uh, I know she's. Uh, I don't want to say a fan favorite, but I, she's been a very interesting character, and I'm liking her less and less with every appearance. And that is Selena Kyle. I'm just putting it out there. Don't like her. Really? Yeah. And it's not the actress. <coughs> actress is fine. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, the character. I think uh, she's. Um, Confusing. Uh, there's a lot of things that I mean. Obviously, the the real Catwoman obviously is very sorted, and you know they're always constantly making up new, uh, you know, backgrounds and origins for her. Like we just saw in Catwoman 36. You should totally read that comic book. Um, anyway, um, you know, just talking about how she's part of the mob and all that stuff. Like I think, I don't know. I just think they're confused about how to use this character. But maybe there's something I'm not seeing that we'll we'll learn more about in this season. It definitely seems like they're kind of unsure about what to do with Catwoman. And I, I feel that with a lot of characters on this show, where some of them have very clearly defined arcs. The older ones especially. Jim Gordon, they know exactly what he's doing because he's an adult. Penguin, they know exactly what he's doing because he's an adult. Riddler, the same. But Catwoman, you can't really have her achieve her destiny for a very long time. So she's been a very tangential figure to all of these events on the show. But there's no like clear thing that they're working towards. So that seems to make it difficult to figure out exactly what they want to do with her. This season, what they have her working directly underneath the Penguin. That could be fun. I'm excited to see what they do with that. I... I... I think the main thing that I didn't like about Catwoman in the previous season, I liked her all the way up until the last episode when she turned on everybody and sort of it was like a sudden face heel turn kind of thing if you read the TV tropes. But it was she's in in the comics like she's got a defined moral moral uh, compass. Mm -hmm. Even though she like she's a neutral type character, but in the show, she seems to be motivated particularly by doing the opposite of what people expect of her. Which, so like when Bruce is like, "Hey, so you're my girlfriend now," she's like, "No, go away. I'm gonna like rob your house now," <laughs> and it's not really conducive to me liking her because you want the bad character to do good thing. Like, you want the character that you know is secretly a good character to do good things instead of making stupid mistakes and ruining her life, and it ruins your life as you're watching it. <laughs> did, did anyone else see that get <laughs> intensely personal all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> but my point is that seeing her now in the trajectory the trajectory the tra 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 trajectory that she's on is not where I want her to be on the show right now, and so that's... Now I have to deal with that. I have to live with this situation. Thanks, Dad. So, um... <laughs> 
Kyle, why don't you tell us what you think about the show, either about uh, Catwoman or, or something else? I think just in general, like we've been talking about the tone of the show, and I think for me it has to do with the characters are kind of finally settling into their roles. And we like we know from the comic books that Enigma has is going to be on this path to become the Riddler. We know that Penguin is going to eventually be a mob boss. And so to finally kind of see them you know, not fight against this role that we know is their destiny and kind of finally settling into this good and evil, you know, we know which side they're going to kind of fall on. It's been fun to see, you know, it develop, but now that they're actually in it, you know, it feels more comfortable and it feels like they're able to do the things on the show that we know that they should be doing, if that makes sense. I'm just yeah. glad that we're really getting to the heart of the Riddler as a character and we're seeing the real Riddler. The Riddler who spontaneously murders people because he has split personality disorder and his evil half is telling him, driving him to kill. Are you being sarcastic? What? No, that's... It's the, the Riddler? They, yeah. No, that's the Riddler. Okay. <laughs> Got that face fade. I don't feel that way. I disagree. <laughs> Edward Dingma, the Riddler. Half of I his feel... face is... Never mind. I feel like the character is... I feel like he's very heavy-handed. Like, not him himself, but the the making him, like, split personality all... In fact, every time I saw him in the previous season, he was always a very sort of like, this is the Riddler, he's a nut job, <laughs> or he's an awkward guy who asked riddles. That seemed very heavy-handed to me in ways that I didn't like about, like, all of the things I don't like about this show are when it's some when someone is presented like this guy's the bad guy. Look at him; he's the he's bad doing, guy. He's doing the like gimmick. That. Yeah, I don't like that. I, I want them to be like natural, and I feel like in this episode, a lot of people were more naturally in their roles, like Kyle was saying. But I also feel like that character in particular, very still being hammered into the position that I don't feel is appropriate. One of the themes that I've noticed um, in this episode is everybody has a dark secret, it seems. Uh, even Bruce Wayne, who's you know only 12 or 13 at this point, um, already has one. Jim Gordon has a really nasty one now. Um, where do you think they're going with this? Is this is this just to set the tone, or do you think that um, it's going to be uh, like a, a plot of blackmail where Everybody's got dirt on everybody else, and everybody's constantly <clears throat> doing bad things in order to achieve good goals. Like that was Bruce Wayne's sort of mantra there when he was talking to Jim Gordon about, um, you know, getting uh, losing his job at the Force, which was, you know, sometimes you, you have to do a bad thing for the greater good. Do you think this is going to be what season two is all about? Everybody's just doing nasty things for the greater good. That's Gotham. Like that is Gotham. Gotham makes everybody down in the mud and the dirt. Like, you can't stay clean in Gotham. Like, even Batman, you know, can't stay completely clean. That's that's what Gotham, the city, does to the people that live there. I mean, they kind of uh, they kind of address that in... <clears throat> there was that big moment where Jim Gordon comes to Bruce to apologize that he's not going to be able to go after his parents. And they really had Bruce deliver what I would call the first Batman monologue of the show where he does that thing about, like, so you're saying that because you're too weak and uh, cowardly to do something, to step over to the other side, you can't do that. You don't have the strength to do the right thing. And he's a little nicer about it. But it, it's like it's so bad. That's the first moment where you're like, okay, he's he's being Batman. This is like the seeds. Whereas all last season was just him like, oh, I scraped my knee and my parents are dead. Um so yeah, it, it seems like that is that that moment to me kind of like brought the whole episode together. I just want to talk about Bruce in general because I feel like when he's on the show, that is my favorite part of the show. I only care about what's I guess I care about what's happening with Jim, but I also when Bruce and Alfred are together on the screen, that's when I'm the most like engaged in the show and that scene in particular, I felt kind of... I feel like that's the wrong Batman. That's like Dark Knight Returns <coughs> Batman and not like Chuck Dixon 1997 Batman, which Ooh. I am okay with. But uh, I think also, just to skip ahead to the part at the end which where they discover Thomas Wayne's secret room 
which I thought was really cool. Like, I was worried that they're going to be like, Dear Bruce, here's a bat cave. You're welcome. Whereas <laughs> instead it's more like, <laughs> it was Dear also Bruce, crazy. we're continuing the story from the previous season where you were discovering corruption in my company. Now go and do that. But also, what I liked, I really liked the message of that that uh, letter, which was that if you're if you want to be happy, don't seek the truth. But then I felt like it was kind of a little weird and awkward when they said, "Unless you feel a calling," because <laughs> it that was again <laughs> one of those moments where it's like. This guy's Batman. He's feeling a calling. You wouldn't want to pursue this. Unless you think it's like your destiny or something, but it's probably not. Exactly. So I think they... I think it's just a case where they could have written that, phrased that slightly differently rather than being like, unless you feel a calling. Or they could have just left that line out. Yeah. Yeah. Because the truth was, he feels a calling, but... I thought I sort of Speaking thought of, I was afraid that him having some kind of closure in getting this letter from his dad kind of negates the possibility of him becoming Batman. That's sort of what I felt like. This is closure. He's happy now. So, eh, what does this mean? Like, I guess having his destiny be that he has to seek the truth now, a little more motivation to be Batman in a different kind of way than than vengeance. I don't know. Continue. Um, while we're on the subject of Bruce and Alfred also, I just want to bring it... Can we talk about that high five that they shared? Can we, I don't know if we can... We can <laughs> right after the ball? That video. Yeah, oh, it was so nice. I, I, I totally agree. That was an awesome high five. I just love those little moments between the two of them where they're just, like, happy and having fun and loving each other. Yeah. All right, guys, we are running very low on time, so why don't we go around one more time. Is there any final thoughts from each of you on uh, either hopes for the, uh, the rest of the season or something in particular that you, uh, that you really liked? Billy, we'll start with you. Hopes for the rest of the season? Well, I know that when it comes to Gotham, what I can't get enough of is baby versions of villains I like doing things that vaguely resemble the thing they're famous for. I want baby Clayface, and he's a pottery student. I want young Bane, and he can't stop drinking energy drinks. That's what I want. Yep, that sums it up. (laughs) You're saying exactly the opposite of what I want from this show. Uh, on purpose, I think. Uh, Young Crazy Quilt can't. He's, he's crocheting on the subway. Um, I one other thing that I liked about this was more the getting to see the situation going on in Arkham, uh, and I think if they become like a little band of fun time brothers, I don't know why I said it that way, but if they become like a cohesive group. Of like of characters that we can get, but to not know. a squad. But not a squad. Not a squad. I did have that <laughs> thought though. I was like, hmm, this seems kind of like maybe they want to start a squad of suicide. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> but I did. I did like the dynamic of the characters in Arkham Asylum. Even even the little Joker guy who. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I did like him, and I liked just the relationship that was being... the dynamic that was being presented in Arkham. Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Brad. Kyle? I think I would like to see a little bit more of Jim Gordon just being a cop instead of playing the politic game in the the precinct and just kind of building, you know, going up, busting criminals and, you know, kind of advancing instead of just, like, taking on the upper echelon of the GCPD. I mean, I know eventually that's kind of his destiny is to kind of rise to the top, but just the politics and everything is just kind of getting old, I think, for me. So I'd like to see less of that. I want want to see a mustache. Yes. Maybe a mohawk? Like, uh, no, no. (laughs) All right, well, that, that just about does it for this week's episode, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the... Uh, 
the show as much as I did. Um, so I'll, we'll, uh, first of all, I just wanted to, again, close it off by saying um, uh, we will be at New York Comic Con uh, coming up uh, next week. If you happen to be there and want to say hello, shoot us a line either on uh, Comic Book Showcase, our YouTube channel, or at Marvel Database, or at DC Database, our Twitter feeds. Um, closing question for the night. Um, did season two premiere of Gotham make you f give you better hope for season two? And do you think it'll uh, ring more true? And, and do you think it's uh, more enjoyable than the first season? Um, thank you very so much for joining us, and uh, take care and talk to you soon. One of the things that I've noticed um, in this episode, I don't know about uh, the whole season two, obviously, but um, is the theme of dark secrets. And everybody seems to have one. Um, even, you know, uh, Tim Gordon. Are we good? Are you good? That was really loud. <laughs> oh, was it? I'm sorry. Like, incredibly loud. Like, I couldn't even hear myself talk. Anyway. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a microphone. Anyway, uh, so My I'll bad. take that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's a highlight.